shown to us through your son Jesus Christ through his sacrifice on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sins and not his own for his willingness to have his blood shed and his body broken on our behalf we thank you for your spirit who indwells us as followers of you who gives us direction guidance and reminds us and speaks to our spirit of the confidence of our faith in you we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather here this morning to fellowship with one another, to be challenged and encouraged by your word, and to be able to sing praises of your goodness, your grace, and your glory. We pray for those who can't be with us, those whose, whose uh, stage of life keeps them uh, bound off into their homes. We pray for those who are struggling with health situations that are beyond their personal ability to meet but are in reliance upon you and those who you've given wisdom to to treat their illnesses. We thank you, Lord, for your continued blessing on our lives. We pray for our nation. We pray for truth to come forth and people to embrace truth and not lies. We pray, Lord, that you would do in our country, in our state, in our local communities, in our families, in our own lives, the work that you would have to be done. May we thank you for it. May we follow you carefully through that plan that you have and the work that you do. And may we be faithful each day that you give us to serve you 
and to model your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated for a moment. A couple of things. Angel Closet is going to be happening this coming weekend. If you haven't signed up to help out during the days, which is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we encourage you to do that. There's going to be um, some more work, um, kind of hopefully to finish it up on tomorrow night during the Awana time. So if you're typically come here from 6 to 8 o'clock on Monday night and you'd like to come out tomorrow night, there is no Awana, but if you'd like to come out, you could help out with the final setups for Angel Closet downstairs. And we encourage you to be part of that. Family fellowships are coming back. We have three sign-up sheets out in the foyer. We have some posters out in the foyer that tell you what the studies are. Um, one of them Don Miller is doing is The Story by Randy Frazee. It's a book that deals with the story of the Bible. Um, Keith is doing a study from Chip Ingram, which has a lot of words in it that I don't remember. Good to great in God's eyes. Um, that's what Keith is doing. And I am doing one that is called uh, Reading the Bible for All It's Worth. We're going to explore how you can read the Bible and understand it to answer the questions you have. Um, what do you do with the Psalms? What do you do with the Bible stories and, and things like that? We're going to be doing that. You can read a full description or a little more description out on the posters that are in the foyer that are posted. Um, the the sign-up sheets are all right over by the windows. All the sign-up sheets for now are over there because if you look over to the other table, there's a setup there um, with regard to um, the shoebox project um, through Samaritan. And uh, if you want to be part of that, look at what is there, and you can see information about that. May, may I encourage you, spend some time in the foyer today looking at what's going on. Youth, there's some sign-ups there for you for events that you are participating in as well. A um, lot going on, starting to ramp up. I got this week in the mail two more nativity ornaments. I think I'm up to four already. I found two that I wanted. I bought them. They came. They're, they're gorgeous. I love them. So if you're not yet thinking about Christmas, the big tree is going to be sitting right there. I don't know where Sandy's going to stand, but the tree, it's going to be somewhere right here. There's going to be a giant tree, and we're going to put just nativity-oriented ornaments on it. They don't have to be the whole nativity scene. It could be a shepherd. It could be Mary. It could be baby Jesus just in, a, in, in the cradle. Um, you figure that out. We're going to have that tree up here. It's going to, I'm excited about it. I asked my wife when we were putting the trees up at our house. She says, we're not this year. And I says, we have to. And she says, just kidding. There'll be one in every room. So if you want to see a lot of Christmas trees this season, just come by the house. We'll have trees in every room. We're excited about what Christmas is going to be. Our call to worship this morning comes out of Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to sing. Let me invite you to stand with us as we sing, come let us worship and bow down. worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture. Sheep of his hand, just the sheep of his hand. Come and bow down every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls my songs the loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song and Sung by flaming tongues above, praise his name, I fix upon it, name of God's redeeming love. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, in the eye constrained to be, but thy goodness, like a feather, find my wandering heart to thee.
scripture reading this morning comes out of 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18, the first five verses. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. This is a great change from what we've been seeing of the kings of Israel, that a man rises to the throne of Judah, a descendant of David himself, and lives according to the words of God and the traditions of his father. And we will see how the world does not necessarily appreciate one who follows God, but would rather challenge that faith in God and see who wins in the end. The song we're going to sing just before the message speaks about the battle that belongs only to the Lord, and he will be the champion. seated. We'll invite the kids up here as we talk about who do you trust. You'd think after like 20 years, I'd figure out my microphone. Hey, Theo, how are you doing? Good? It's your, it's your weekly trip to the platform? Do you ever have a weekly trip to the woodshed? Yeah? You don't even know what that means, but a bunch of us do. Take my hand there, buddy. All right, so we're going to talk about who do you trust? Who are you going to trust? There's a whole lot of people will tell you a lot of things. The question is, are you going to believe them and act according to what they say? Or are you going to do something else? I'm going to give you four scenarios. Here's the first one. A sibling or cousin, uh, put up the picture for me, offers you a piece of unwrapped candy. Do you eat it? No. Raise your hand if you eat it. Your sibling or cousin gives you unwrapped candy. Raise your hand. Put your hands down. Raise your hand. You don't eat it. You, 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 don't, you don't trust them. Where'd they get that candy? Okay, <laughs> there you go. Uh, depends how well you like your cousin or your brother. All right, number two. Your friend tells you there is a surprise in the back corner of a dark attic or basement. Do you go in? There's a surprise in the back of a dark. So you guys are going in? Put your hands down. Those of you are not going in. You don't know what that surprise is, right? Yeah. All right. All right. 
Zero. Third one, you're standing on a four-foot wall and your dad tells you to jump and he will catch you. Do you jump? Do you remember doing that? We had that four-foot wall in front of the house on Academy Street. We used to practice. You were like two. Come on, man, jump. Jump. Did you jump? I, I, wow, I'm not catching you now. I mean, let's be honest about this. Did you do it? Would you jump? Yeah. Have you ever heard the phrase, have you, shh, have you ever heard the phrase, if your friend tells you to jump off a bridge, are you going to do it? No. No, but if your brother tells you to, I'm all in. No. All right, I'll tell you sometime the story we jumped off bridges into the water. What? Yeah, 30 feet. The sign said no swimming. It said nothing about jumping. That's law, following the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. I can show you right where it is in New Hampshire, in the National Park. Here's the last one. The team you are going to play against in soccer says you don't have a chance to win, so you might as well forfeit. Do you forfeit? No. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're faster. They have all big kids, and you guys are all puny. Do you forfeit? Who do you trust? Do you trust them to say they're going to whoop you, or do you trust your coach who says, hey, you got this? You going to trust the coach? Okay. Yeah, you trust your coach? Excellent. What if your dad gives you a different instruction? Who are you going to trust? Oh, the coach. So your dad has to become the coach. That's what I did, because I wanted to tell my kids what to do in track. So I became the coach, so I could tell them what to do. Let me tell you about the Bible. Let me tell you about the kingdom of Assyria. Put the picture up for me there. So the kingdom of Assyria had been conquering everything. They conquered the whole northern kingdom, took them away captive, crushed all their cities. Now they're putting their eyes on Judah, the southern kingdom, where Hezekiah is king. They've come down and they've conquered 40 cities. And now they send a great army to Jerusalem and surround the city and send some representatives to talk to the representatives of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, obviously, is king. is not going to the wall. But he sends a few trusted advisors to the wall, and the people who represent the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, shout out to the leaders of Jerusalem, of Judah, the representatives of the king, and says, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to trust? Hezekiah is dismantling your worship of God. Who are you going to trust? Has any God ever stood against Assyria and our gods? We have destroyed everybody. Who are you going to trust? And at the end of the conversation, the representatives of Hezekiah go back to Hezekiah. They tear their clothes because they are afraid and they are worried. Who are you going to trust? We're going to talk about that in the morning message this morning. Those who are going to Children's Church can go. There's outlines up there if you'd like. This morning's message is about competition. I titled it The Battle of the Gods. The world loves to compete. As we think about our own desires of, of life, we love to choose a side, and often when we choose that side, we dig in and people can't move us from that. I, I looked this up because I remembered this well. On November 13th, 1976, the first episode of Battle of the Network Stars came on. Some of you are old enough, and maybe you watched the, that, that mock athletic competition. That show went on for 12 years. I did not realize it was on that long. It was on for 12 years, and they put your favorite entertainers in competition with one another. They put them in sneakers and sweatpants. If you remember what the 70s and the early 80s were like, I mean... The clothing we wore for athleticism was quite horrendous, quite embarrassing, 
quite foolish, but they paraded their athletic talents. So you saw your, your favorite uh, female stars in sitcoms against the movie stars over here. And they, they, did, they did events on the track that involved running. They rode bikes. They even did tug of war. I mean, they did outlandish, crazy things. But to add credibility to that show, Howard Cosell was the host. Howard Cosell, the voice of Monday Night Football, one of the most respected um, uh, reporters on sports in the world, did all the great boxing matches. He was the host of the Battle of the Network Stars. And to add more credibility, they recruited an Olympic champion and world record holder to be the commentator, decathlete Bruce Jenner. He had just come off winning the decathlon at the Olympics and setting a new world record, and he became the commentator during that series. Millions of people tuned into that program to cheer on their favorite celebrities. We love competition. Now, some of you are probably not as devoted to the 4th of July hot dog eating contest in which Joey Chestnut has set the world record of 67 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Maybe you haven't tuned into that. I've watched it multiple times. Anybody who's willing to take a hot dog in his bun, soak it in water before shoving it in your throat, and swallowing 67 of those in 10 minutes is worthy of your 10 minutes. It is, or at least the highlights on ESPN. So you may not be into that. You may have preferred those boxing matches in which Mike Tyson, in less than 40 seconds, knocked out his opponents or chewed the ear off of another champion. You might, have, you might have found that more to your liking in the area of competition. We like to cheer our champion. Uh, at school, when I'm, when I'm subbing over there, a couple of the, the uh, uh, um, PE teachers are always asking me what I think about what's going on in baseball. I guess they're playoffs or something. I said, I don't know. I don't care. And he says, well, what about football? I says, I says, Mr. Murphy, let's talk track and field. It's the only thing I care about. I don't care about any other sports. I used to be an avid fan of football. I used to be an avid fan of a lot of things. And I just, I only have so much time. And how are you going to watch Hallmark movies if you're going to watch sporting events? How are you going to see just clean love interest and Christmas um, stories if you're going to watch some foolish thing about who's better, the Yankees or the Red Sox? Now, some of you are new to the church and you didn't know Gretchen McDaniel who was here, but I was a Red Sox fan having grown up in New England, and she was not. She was a Yankee fan, and any time the Red Sox could beat the Yankees, I always mentioned it to Gretchen. Anytime the Yankees were winning, I just ignored her. I don't know whether you prefer Pepsi over Coke. I don't, I don't know if you prefer Android over iPhone. I don't know if you prefer, I shouldn't even say this, Ford versus Chevy. Maybe it's Tesla versus uh, everybody else. I don't know. Cars have changed. Most competitions are friendly, aren't they? Some get a little more serious. Most competitions concern our preferences, right? Sometimes it involves our core beliefs. On a national level, the battle between truths and culture can become eminently violent and last for years. There was a, there was a guy on, a, on an interview this last week who is in some degree opposed to Israel as a nation. And they asked him, why are you so adamantly opposed to a national Israel? He says, I don't think any nation should be built on ethnicity or religion. And that was his definition, because Israel, in his mind, is a nation that's been built on a single ethnic group and on a single religion. When you talk about those kind of things on a national level, things can become quite heated. Uh, the, the, the tribalism that occurs in Eastern Europe and Africa is not solved by erecting national boundaries. <laughs> The winner of such battles over culture and truth often declare the superiority of their position once they win. By winning, I have proven that my beliefs, my truths, 
My culture is superior because I won. And that's the basis. The ancient world was built on the idea that victory is credited to God. If you win, your God is stronger. That was the ancient world. We have similar approaches to victory. We simply don't identify it with a God because we've moved so far away from the idea of God. But the ancient world was surrounded by the belief that my God is greater than your God because I won. That's the battle of the gods. When Assyria defeated Israel and carried the people away into captivity, the Assyrians considered their gods greater than the God of Israel. If the God of Israel was so powerful, they would have been able to hold us off. If the God of Israel was so great, they would have not only held us off, they'd have defeated us and pushed us back. Is that true? Was the God of Israel just a regional God? A God over a small little part, a small little group of people, and as long as they were comfortable in that existence, that God had no power over anybody beyond those boundaries. Could Judah, now that Israel, the northern kingdom, has fallen, could Judah expect any greater protection from God, since apparently God was not interested in protecting Israel? Could the king of Judah trust God? See, is our faith, we're going to see the faith of Hezekiah this morning, is our faith in God and his word, the Bible, because we have a written record from God of the things he thinks, the things he demands, the way the world is, is our faith in God and his word, the Bible, sufficient to meet the world and its might? Can we take our faith in this book and come out victorious against the world's philosophy, the world's might, the world's interest, and the world's direction? 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1 says this, Now it came to pass that Hezekiah began to reign. Verse 2, he was 25 years old, verse 3, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. I, I've taken out all the other parts of the verses to just to get to these three points. Hezekiah began to reign. Verse 2, he was 25 years old. Verse 3, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. How do we prepare for the inevitable fight? How should we prepare ourselves every day for the opposition that the world presents, both in its philosophy and its practice? How do you stand against things that are morally impug impugnant, how do you stand against philosophies that go directly against your desires? Hezekiah chose to follow God. That's what Hezekiah did. He followed God. He did what was right. We have to start with the obvious commands. I was at an ordination council yesterday. I was sitting on the council for Pastor Paul Brown of Glen Baptist Church. He was getting ordained. They invited 19 of us pastors in to examine his theology, to examine his testimony of faith, to examine his call to ministry. And we spent from 9 o'clock in the morning till noon doing that. At one point in the questioning, it got into some of the weeds of theology, some of the, some of the minor things. And, and there was a refreshing thing that Pastor Brown um, brought up. He says, we have to start with the basic commands, obey them, and then God will have the freedom to direct our steps. So there's a verse in the Psalms that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The problem with that verse is we misinterpret it. We think if we delight in the Lord, God will give us what we want, the desires of our heart. No, if we delight in the Lord, God will give us the right desires. He'll put the desires in our heart. So if we start with obedience of the things we know, then God can direct us in the things we're not yet sure. And that's where Hezekiah starts. He has not been living in a perfect kingdom. All the kings of Judah, even as descendants of David, did not always follow God. And as Hezekiah became king at 25 years of age, for the next 29 years, he began to pursue what God wanted. Verse 4, chapter 18, he removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. 
There's some significant things here. Things we saw in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, that they never abandoned. They liked the high places. They liked the convenience of having a place to worship that wasn't far from home. They didn't want to always travel to the centerpiece of worship, Jerusalem and the temple, but rather couldn't they just stay home this week? Couldn't they just tune into the radio, watch on television, catch a podcast that will give me my spiritual food for the day? He removed those high places. He broke down those sacred pillars, those actual images they had constructed to give them their sense that this was a place of worship. It's not enough to have a location, but you need something that shows you it's worship. Vicky and I were in a small town in Italy on the coast. We did this tour where we took the train from one small fishing village to the next. And I think it was the second village we visited that, that day on that trip. And down at the base, it was always a rocky hillside, and the, and the village was built on the hillside, but down at the base would be the harbor. And down at the harbor was a church. And we wandered into that church, and I was never more impressed by a small, humble little church that had a crucifix with Jesus on the cross. Bear with me. Jesus on the cross and carved by hand and standing about this high on a small table. Now, I understand that Jesus is not on the cross, but as I walked in there, it just so starkly reminded me that Jesus was on the cross. And sometimes we miss that image, that Jesus was on the cross for us, that it's not just a symbol like we have here, the empty cross, the price is paid, but actually a person hung on that and died on that. And so I wasn't offended by Jesus on the cross. I was taken aback that when people at least walked into that church in that Italian town, they were confronted with Jesus was real and Jesus died for us. That's an image that takes you into the worship. Well, if you just create any old thing as a place to worship, God says don't do that. And so Hezekiah tore them down and he broke he cut down the wooden image. There apparently was one particular image. Maybe it was in Jerusalem itself that he says, this has got to go. And then there was that bronze serpent that Moses had made. They had taken that bronze serpent that had survived centuries in the hands of Israel, and they'd erected it so they could burn incense to it. Again, a graven image created by Moses at the direction of God to solve a particular problem the people had rejected God as their leader and they needed a symbol to draw them back and to save them from the snakes, the serpents that had risen up to bite and kill them. And Hezekiah sees it as, you've gone too far. So Hezekiah rid Judah of all its false worship. Verse five, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah and who were before him. Hezekiah puts his hope that's this word trust, puts his hope in the Lord, and the Lord does not disappoint him. He puts his hope in God, and God lifts him up to be the premier example of a follower of God. What this says to me in this battle that we face, and the battle that Hezekiah was going to face against Assyria, what this shows me is you have to choose a side in the battle. And you have to prove your loyalty day after day after day. There's been this, I, I can never explain how Facebook determines the things that I need to see. But in my reels has been a doctor, a doctor who delivers babies. And these reels have been this doctor videotaped as he resuscitates baby after baby after baby who is struggling to breathe on their own after birth. I mean, I, I'm watching this one. And, and so I, I paused it to see how long the video was. The video was three and a half minutes long and I'm going, I don't know if I can watch three and a half minutes of a baby not yet breathing. And he is, he is 
putting an airbag on the baby and pumping. He is rubbing the baby in certain places on its body. And I'm watching, and I've seen like four of these videos now. And I'm going, at some point, you've got to choose your side on babies, right, and life. I mean, at some point, you've got to choose your side. This doctor putting these videos out is probably not real popular. And I even looked at a few of the comments, and I said, I can't look at these comments, because there's comments there that are criticizing him for resuscitating a baby who's not yet breathing at birth. And, and he even presents, this isn't every baby he deals with, but the ones he does, I, I don't know, it, it just astounds me. And you might say, that's all fake, and maybe it is, but you know what? It moved me to remember what side I choose. And God says here through Hezekiah, he chose the side of the Lord. Verse 6, for he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from following him. How much pressure might there be if you decide to do a great reformation of your nation? If you decide to make a rule that everybody has to tear down their high places and their pillars, and he's going to get rid of the bronze serpent, and he's going to I mean, what would the up, what would the pushback be? You know, you might be king, but you won't always be king. Verse 7, the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. And in that prosperity, he decides to rebel against the king of Assyria and does not serve him. So when Assyria came down and conquered the northern kingdom, it made an assumption that it would control the south as well because they were the big dog in the world. And Hezekiah decides in this moment, I will no longer pay tribute. I will no longer give money for protection from Assyria because they will never be satisfied. And he rebels as God gives him prosperity within his kingdom, meaning the people begin to turn to God. They don't rebel against his reforms to follow God. He has the boldness and the hope in the Lord that he won't have to bow to the knee of Assyria. What does Assyria think of Israel's God? So they besieged Samaria. They conquered Israel. They carried the people away. Do you think the world system fears the church who values love and peace? You think the world system, I'm talking individual people you know, but the world system that is against God. Do you think they fear those of us who would value above all things love and peace? Peace with God, love for one another, love for God. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second commandment is like unto that, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you think the world fears people who love? And we can just push you over. I mean, what are you going to do? You're not going to fight back. They'll even say to us, right, what does what your, your, your Jesus tell you to do? Turn the other cheek, right? Just, just accept what's going on. What does Assyria think? Assyria turns their eyes on Judah and King Hezekiah. Verse 13, 2 Kings 18. And in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. What does Assyria think? Assyria does not follow God. Assyria follows its own might. Right? How many people in our culture follow their own might, their own power, their own wealth? No one in this era of the 7th century BC, no one could stand before Assyria. They conquered at will. And Hezekiah hoped to avoid Assyria's wrath. Do not the wealthy and the powerful do as they please? I mean, how, don't we see that in the, in, the, in the present world, whether it's our nation or other nations? The people who are wealthy, the people who are powerful, however you define their power, their power might be wrapped up in their wealth, their power might be wrapped up in political um, and other concerns, but don't they think... They can do as they please. We see it unraveling in our own nation. People who for a long time were very powerful did as they please, and now things are coming out, and it seems to be unraveling. 
verse 14, chapter 18, then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong, turn away from me, whatever you impose on me, I will pay. Now he offers to pay some more tribute. So now he's been, to some degree, intimidated. Before, Assyria stayed in the north and didn't bother what was happening in the south. Now he decides, I'm going to take over everything, comes in with his armies, conquers at will, and Hezekiah offers him 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. The talent is a large amount, and of course, silver is less valuable than gold, so you can give more silver than you can gold. Do those who are less powerful and less wealthy sometimes feel intimidated by those who are powerful, and do we sometimes feel weak, like we have no ability to change things? If a person can throw $100 million at something, how, is that gonna, how are you going to overcome that? If a government says they want your land and they have this legal system behind them to take your land, are you really going to be able to fight that? Here is Hezekiah trying to buy his way out of trouble. So he strips the gold from the temple. Remember, he's reestablished worship at the temple. Now he strips the gold of the temple and takes all of the silver from the entire treasury. Everything that's in the temple that's silver, everything that's in the treasury is silver. He needs 300 talents. He's basically giving a one-time payment of all the wealth he has. Would that be enough? Would that be enough to satisfy Assyria? Would Assyria turn around, go back to its own nation, and leave Judah alone? Well, it says in verse 17, then the king of Assyria sent two people, Tartan and the Rabshakeh, with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. He actually sends an army directly to the city and sends two representatives. The one man is named Tartan. The other has the title of the Rabshakeh. I don't know if this would be the, the, the head of the State Department or an ambassador, who these would be. One might be a military leader. One might be, an, might be a, a, a political leader. But Assyria sends its great army to Jerusalem. So imagine, imagine our Secretary of State and, um, and our ambassador to a certain nation um, set an appointment to meet with the president, the king of another nation. And as they arrive, they come with three battalions of marines three battalions and all the things that go with that and they land at the airport and the king or the president or the prime minister was there to meet our representatives from our nation and they're confronted by 2,000 soldiers fully armed oh, would you think they're seeking peace would America be demonstrating that we are coming in peace? So if you go to Colonial Williamsburg and you go into the palace of the governor, and you walk into the foyer of the palace, it's this, this circular room that is covered in weaponry, rifles with bayonets and swords. And they're real, and they were real. And the point of it was, when you entered into the palace of the governor, the governor who was sent by the king of England to be the governor of the colony of Virginia, you need to understand who had the power. Who has the power? The guy with the weapons. And so when the revolution was starting to form, one of the first things that they did in Williamsburg was the governor confiscated all the weapons from the armory, that were the weapons for the militia and took them all, having his own cache of weapons so that there couldn't be a rebellion. Assyria shows up with an army, not for negotiation, but for intimidation. Is Assyria satisfied with what they received? Are the rich and powerful in our world ever satisfied? There's, a great, there's the famous quote of John D. Rockefeller the first the man who controlled 10% of the gross domestic product of America at one point. They asked him, how much more do you need? And his answer was, a little more. I need a little more. Second Kings chapter 18, verse 18. And when they had called to the king, the king is not going to be on the wall, but they're going to call to the messengers of the king. We're going to relate directly what is said. Verse 19, the Rabshakeh said to them, say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this in which you trust? 
You stop paying tribute. Now all of a sudden you think you can throw a bunch of money at us. Who do you think you are trusting? So Assyria dismisses Israel's God. Verse 20. You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? I mean, you're posturing. Every once in a while, I see a video of, uh, of uh, I guess we don't do boxing much anymore. It's all like UFC. It's Ultimate Fighting Championships. And I, I watched this one clip where they were showing the two at the weigh-in, and one was just, just posturing, basically saying to the other guy, you don't have a chance. You don't have a prayer. I'm going to whoop you. I'm going to wipe the floor with you. 30 seconds into their bout, the guy who was posturing was on his back and was done. I like watching those kind of videos. People are so pompous, they're so arrogant. Before they've done anything or proven anything, they think they are the champion. Well, here is, here is Assyria who has a long track record of victory. And they are dismissing anything that Israel, that Judah thinks it could do. The question is, who is your God? That's what Assyria is asking. Who's your God that you're trusting in? But if you say, verse 22, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has taken away? So now he's speaking to the representatives and not directly to Hezekiah, but he's talking about Hezekiah. He says, you know, Hezekiah is trusting in his God. Who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in his God? Are you trusting in Hezekiah? Well, Hezekiah seems to be dismantling your worship of God. See, is the object of our faith considered significant? When people think about what we believe in, maybe a lot of people don't know exactly what we believe in or who we believe in. Um, we are not called Jesus followers. We're called Christians. Christians has moved a long way from being Christ followers in people's understanding. They just go, Christianity is this like big religion. And they celebrate the birth of Jesus, and they celebrate the crucifixion of Jesus, and, his, and that fanciful idea that he rose from the dead. But, I mean, seriously, do they consider Jesus a significant issue to worry about? Does the world think the teachings of the Bible are serious things they should worry about? It'd be hard to say with the amount of sin that's in the world that people really worry about what the Bible says who aren't followers of the Bible and the followers of Jesus Christ. Does Assyria care about the God that the, that the people of Judah worship? Absolutely not. Because again, their viewpoint is, if I win, my God's stronger. And since I've been winning for decades, what does that say about you? And he's going to raise that issue directly. The question is, are we not considered weak because of our faith sometimes? Well, you live by faith. Well, you know, there are, there's work to do. You shouldn't just rely on faith. Is Hezekiah even faithful to his God? That's the question that is raised by the Assyrians. Look, he's taking down all the things that worship your God because they don't understand the true worship of God. They don't understand who is the real God of Israel. They've just seen the typical approach to worship like everybody else. Everybody builds their pillars. Everybody has their little things of worship. Everybody follows, and your king has been tearing it all down. If all of a sudden Christianity shut all of their buildings, shut all of their church buildings, what would the world say about Christianity? It's done, right? You shut down all your buildings. You stop collecting money. You have no wealth. You have no position. You have no power. But couldn't Christianity meet in places without buildings? When the pandemic hit, did Christianity close? Like dentist offices and social security offices and schools. The church didn't close. I mean, it might have closed its building, might have changed this building around, might have had to ask people to come at one time and other people to come at another and meet in the parking lot. 
Might have to put ropes up between the rows so we didn't sit so close. Mice might have even wore masks while singing. That was fun, wasn't it? And Anita found the mask that had metal that stuck them out so you could breathe while singing because we were going to continue to worship God. Right? The world sees our faith often as weak. Assyria has defined God for everyone. Does the world have a true understanding of our faith and what really it is composed of? Verse 25, have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So he is now mocking Hezekiah, mocking the people of Judah, their worship of God by saying, I'm here on God's work. This is God's work. Now, we live in a society now that is so secular that the two sides that are generally drawn is the non-God side and the God side. There are people who are secular completely to their core who claim they're still part of religion but don't ever act as if they are. I, I hope you'll grant me that truth. The people will claim they're still connected to a religion, but act on it wholly as a secular individual who is their own God, who determined that they will follow the God of human wisdom. And here is Sennacherib's representatives basically saying, our God has sent me to destroy you. It is my God who's in charge. For the secular humanists of our society, their belief is they are the God, and the, and, the, and the understanding and wisdom that they bring to the table is far superior to any ancient, fanciful book. I mean, you're trusting in stories of miracles that are ridiculous, impossible, and make no sense, and we are the purveyors of science and education and philosophy. Does not our strength prove God's pleasure? That's what the king of Assyria declares. Does not our strength prove that God is pleased with us? Is a person right because they are wealthy and powerful? Just because a person has money, a person has been successful in life, or has achieved a level of notoriety, does that make them correct? We live in a world where if you can get people to follow you, that means you have truth. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 29. Whose words are we to believe? Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand. Verse 30, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. The city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Can you really trust Hezekiah, who has dismantled your worship? Can you believe his words? Can his faith in his God save you? The tragedy in Christianity so often is that Christianity is led by men who are flawed, men who are still bound in sin, men who, who stray from the path. And when one of those men get exposed for the, the weakness of their own life, the organization, the church, the philosophy, the truth gets dismantled with them. Who among us can say we are not hypocritical at one level or another, including every person of every stripe of belief? And yet, in a moment of challenge, the world will look at any weakness or any failure and say, can you trust the words you have been reading? Can you trust the people you have been following? Can you trust the people who you gather with regularly? 2 Kings 18.32, they continue this theme. But do not listen to Hezekiah lest he persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Can any God save you? 
Here is what Assyria is saying, and think about this in our own lives. Assyria is saying this, are you ready to accept our premise about God? Are you willing to accept our premise about God? The world would say, are you willing to accept our premise about life, our premise about origins, our premise about history? Are you willing to accept our premise about gender? Are you willing to accept our premise about love and marriage and relationship? Are you willing to accept? So Christianity often says, let's not get into a fight over those issues. That's a surrender to some degree, is it not? To not say where you stand, to not say what you believe, when directly presented by the opposing values to your own, is to surrender or at least give that person the impression that you have surrendered to their premise. of life and sexuality and, and the pursuit of prosperity and strength. 2 Kings 18.33 Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its, la its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? I mean, let's look at the track record. Everybody has lost to us. Verse 35, who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord, talking of your God, should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? I mean, seriously. We, we have, we've won the battles. Are you really going to be the last holdout? Would Israel fall to the intimidation of Assyria? Do we sometimes fall to the intimidations of our world? Do we fall to the intimidation of elitism? So a person who goes to the right school and gets the right degree obviously knows more than you. Do we fall to the intimidation of science or philosophy? Because a person has given a great amount of thought to their godless world, does that make their philosophy more correct than your view of God who plainly spells out what man is like? So the Bible clearly explains that man is a sinner and goes on to explain what sin looks like. Sin is wrapped up in the pride of life. Sin is wrapped up in the lust of the flesh. Sin is wrapped up in the lust of the eyes. Sin is wrapped up in the desire for, um, the, the, the desire for money, the love of money. Sin is wrapped up in, in uh, uh, pursuing everything that is right in our own eyes, defining what is right and wrong. That, the Bible defines for us sin. So you get a person, a philosopher, a person who goes to an Ivy League school, gets the best education in secular philosophy and, human, uh, and humanism, and they don't believe in the existence of a God, so they muse as to how we got here, and they come up with the craziest notions that how you were treated by your mother when you were 16 months old has shaped your desire to be a serial killer. I mean, they come up with the most outlandish things, and the fact that you think you're a cat is all right, because cats are beautiful little creatures. But that's the secular humanistic philosophy that says there is no God, so we reject the idea that God made man and woman, that God made humanity different from the rest of creation, that plants don't talk, regardless of how well your plants do when you talk to them. I don't think that has anything to do with your conversation. Because we talk at our plants in our house all the time. Why are you dying? <laughs> what is your problem? If we are doing something wrong, please tell us, and we will correct it. Because are you seriously on a suicide mission? Because if plants can talk, they should be telling us how to correct their existence so they will do better. But the world will look at the godless nature of humanity and life and say it's not a bad thing to wipe out two-thirds of humanity because the plants deserve a place in which we're not killing them. 
Guess what? My plants have never complained about me killing them. They haven't talked to me at all. I feel bad about the fact that we are incapable of growing something. At some point when the world doesn't have supermarkets, we're coming to your house. Because we will be starved after just a short period of time. But the world creates what we see in a sense as being, um, in our perspective, ridiculous propositions. But without God, in their elitism, they make declarations that appear to be superior to the small-mindedness of the person who follows the Bible. Well, life is much more complex than the way you are defining it. Really? Is it? Is there 3,000 genders? I don't know. It seems God made it really clear, except in the nature of chickens and figuring out whether they're boys or girls. I hear that's a really tough thing with little baby chicks to figure out if they're boys or girls. Eventually, they grow up and you'd figure out if they're boys or girls on that chicken side. I think God has said, I'm going to make it really clear. I'm going to make things black and white. I'm going to make things uh, um, positive and negative. I'm going to show you righteousness and sin. And even the ancient Eastern philosophers said there was yin and yang. They saw this dichotomy, this, this idea of things being of two things and not ten. Second Kings 18.36, but the people, having been intimidated, having been told they were foolish to follow Hezekiah, held their peace and answered him not a word. I don't know if they understood the principle, don't answer a fool in their folly. If they'd read much of the works of Solomon, the wisest man to live. But at least in that moment, the people who were there, the leaders of the kingdom, those sent by Hezekiah to meet these representatives of Syria and the people who are surrounding them, they decide not to answer the question. I give credit to Paul, uh, Pastor Paul Brown yesterday. There were some questions he simply said, I don't know that. There were a few guys who liked to put out the theological jargon, and I'm sitting next to Pastor Elijah Belts, and we're having a good time over in the corner. And, uh, and so one pastor would give out this theological jargon, you know, these, these like, like eternal secession. I think that was one of them. I had no idea what they were talking about. And I said to Elijah, what is he talking about? Elijah goes, I don't know. Now, Elijah kept asking questions about Hebrew. He kept bringing up Hebrew words because Elijah loves the original languages. And, and this guy apparently loves the theological terminology. And at some points, Pastor Brown just says, I don't know what that is. And I wanted to say, neither do I. And so I would ask a question in plain English. I tried to use words that were, you know, common vocabulary and asked, do you think the Bible teaches A, B, C, and D? I wanted to see where he was because I hadn't seen that in the paper. It was an expansion of the truth. And he'd go, and, and he picked up pretty quick, Pastor Brown did, to say yes. I was not trying to trick him. I was trying to say, have you thought about this application of Scripture as being valid for the point you're making? And he would say yes. But sometimes he'd say, I don't know. Here the people are looking at this intimidating presentation of the power of the Assyrian gods over their God, and they decide to say, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. What do they say? Keep your mouth shut and let people think you're intelligent? Open your mouth and prove the opposite? I always open my mouth. I have no problem with that. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 37. Were they confident in their silence? So then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joha, these are the three who were sent, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn, and they told him the words of the Rebshek. Silence doesn't mean you're not still afraid. Silence doesn't mean you have the answer. Silence doesn't mean you necessarily have the confidence or the commitment of what God is going to do, because frankly, an army of Assyrians who have literally conquered 40 of your own cities plus all of Israel and everything in the environs around, as the text mentions, like seven other nation groups, you are not going to be able to see how you're going to win that battle. 
you've already stripped all the silver and all the gold. You've already given them all the wealth you have. What more do you have to give other than people? Give them people. They took all the people of the northern kingdom for the most part. Took them all to their country. Make them servants. Make them slaves. So just because you may have faith in Hezekiah and faith in God doesn't mean you can see the solution or know what God is going to do. And what we're going to find in our message next week is there's a prophet in town by the name of Isaiah. And he's written a whole big book of prophecies. You can read the whole book of Isaiah. There's plenty of chapters, plenty of material. But here in the life of Hezekiah, Isaiah comes in. Because Hezekiah needs to know some specifics from God. Sometimes we want to have specifics from God. And we'll see that next week, how Hezekiah pursues that. But understand this. We are living in a battle. It has been a battle since the garden. It is not stopped at any moment anywhere in the world where there are those who oppose God and there are those who follow God. And we are in a battle. And we need to understand what the battle lines are. We need to understand whether we are going to know what God thinks. And if we know what God thinks, have we confirmed it with our study of the scriptures and are we willing to stand on the things that we know are clear we're not going to have an answer for every nuance of every question about life but we can be clear on an awful lot and we can stand on those things that we're clear on and that will give us the guidance for all those other smaller tributaries of challenge so that over time we understand a bit more of God, God's word, and God's intention for our life. Dear Father, we ask that as we continue to devote ourselves to your word, as we read the narratives, as we see the proclamations from you and your prophets, as we see the challenge and the discouragement and the fear that men and women have faced over the years as they've walked life in obedience to you, may we find the confidence to understand that each step we take in obedience is always the right step. And we need not fear that we are out of line with your desire and that any things that come at us from the sides, in front, or behind may just be an opportunity for us to live that truth more pointedly in front of others so they are confronted with you. May we be a, an honest and a clear and a forthright representative of your son, Jesus Christ, who has saved us, who has paid for our sin to whom we have committed our lives and our service, may we be a good representative of that in a world that is populated by many people who dismiss your very existence. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand as we sing of our God. you turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our 
our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Tuesday. 